So I'm going to talk about technologies that I think are useful in a transition away from fossil fuels, but also technologies that are not useful. I'll start with the technologies that I think are useful. Uh, first, uh, I'm looking at it from a point of view of not only climate, but also air pollution, which causes about seven and a half million air pollution deaths per year worldwide, costing the world based on a statistical cost of life about $30 trillion per year. Global warming is expected to cost about $30 trillion per year by 2050 uh, in terms of uh, social cost of carbon costs. And so that's this, another uh, major problem that obviously everybody's focused on here. And then uh, energy security is a third problem. And there are many types of energy security issues, one of which is just the fact that fossil fuels are limited resources. And they will run out at some point and that will result in social, economic and political instability. So these are all drastic problems that require drastic solutions. So our solution uh, since about 2009 has been, well, electrify everything and provide the electricity from clean, renewable sources. So if we think of the main energy sectors as electricity slash heat, uh, transportation, buildings, and industry. Um, so electrifying transportation means going primarily to battery electric vehicles, uh, and then some hydrogen fuel cell for long distance heavy transport, like long distance ships and aircraft. Uh, for buildings, uh, electric heat pumps, for air heating, water heating, air conditioning, uh, clothes drying, uh, even dishwashing, uh, heat for dishwashing. Um, these are just much more efficient than gas or any type of combustion heating. Electric induction cooktops for cooking instead of gas uh, reduces energy requirements about 60%. Uh, LED lights, insulation, you know, energy efficiency, energy efficient appliances, etc. Uh, for industry, we primarily electrify industry with um, high temperature uh, industrial uh, equipment, such as arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heaters, electron beam heaters, and also heat pumps. Um, although I'll talk about a new technology called fire bricks that can replace all of these uh, for electrification. In any case, we provide all the electricity in all cases with onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants concentrated solar power in certain locations, some geothermal electricity, hydroelectricity, tidal and wave electricity, although those are really minor at this point, and then some solar and geothermal direct heat. Um, for storage, because we need, the sun doesn't always uh, shine, the wind doesn't always blow, we do need storage. Right now, the largest storage in the world is existing hydroelectric dams. Uh, second largest is pumped hydro storage, but batteries are growing in many parts of the world uh, as a significant storage option, uh, but there are others as well. S concentrated solar power comes with storage a lot of times, flywheels, compressed air storage, gravitational storage of solid masses, and also um, hydrogen uh, storage uh, using fuel cells for grid electricity. But, and then we need some hot and cold storage, uh, water tanks storage for uh, hot and cold, ice for cold, underground storage in boreholes or so soil, basically water pits and aquifers for mostly heat, but some cold and for that's mostly for district heating systems and then building materials and also in fire bricks, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then there's non-grid hydrogen storage as well. And the applications for hydrogen that we think are useful are like ammonia production. This is green hydrogen that is only ammonia production, uh, steel manufacturing, and as I mentioned, long distance transport and then grid hydrogen for fuel uh, with fuel cells in some applications, but not for heating homes. We don't Think it's useful for, uh, for combustion and also uh, just regular automobiles uh, battery electric is much better um, so just for limiting to non the long distance transport for uh, hydrogen for transportation um, and then well can the world transition to 100 percent renewables we we've just completed uh, plans and studies for 149 countries representing 99.75 percent of all world emissions and just to summarize the, you know, among all countries, we develop individual plans for each country, but when we sum over all countries, the end use power demand in 2020 was about 12.6 trillion watts or terawatts across all energy sectors. If we go in a business as usual case to 2050, that goes to about 18.9 terawatts. Uh, but if we electrify and provide the electricity with wind, water, solar, we go down about 54% for five reasons, down to 8.6 terawatts of end use demand in 2050, despite population growth. Uh, due to the efficiency of battery electric and some hydrogen fuel cell vehicles versus internal combustion engine vehicles, due to the efficiency of electrified industry, the efficiency of heat pumps, and then eliminating energy used to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium, and then some end-use energy efficiency improvements beyond business as usual. Well, what does that look like graphically? If we, it, This goes from 2022 to 2050. If we don't do anything, we go along the type, top line to... Uh, to much higher energy requirements in 2050, 18.9 terawatts. 
But if we electrify, provide the electricity with wind, water, and solar, we go down those five shades of colors to the 100% WWS line. And then we need to provide that that wind, water, solar, which is mostly electricity, almost all electricity, uh, with just you know onshore and offshore winds, uh, solar, CSP and PV, some solar heat, rooftop PV, geothermal, electricity and heat, and hydro. And this shows 80% transition by 2030, which is really what we would want ideally because of not only air pollution causes so many deaths per year right now, we need to eliminate uh, combustion as soon as possible, but also because uh, climate warming, we're already at the cusp of 1.5 degrees global warming. And uh, in order to avoid even more warming and to try to get down to 350 parts per million uh, through natural reduction of carbon uh, from the air, because we'll see that eliminating emissions can get you there. Uh, if we eliminate 80% of emissions by 2030 and 100% by 2035 to 2050, we could get to 350 parts per million by 2100 without additional carbon removal. And that, but this is, shows a transition of 80% by 2030, 100% by 2050. Um, however, because of the urgency of the problem and the fact that if we can get to 80% by 2030, there's no reason we can't get to 100% by 2035. This timeline shows a transition of 100% by 2035 with the same endpoint uh, in 2050. So we do need, because we need a rapid transition, we cannot rely on technologies that are that take forever to build or to develop. So this is why we want to deploy, deploy, deploy as fast as possible existing technologies. Well, worldwide transition with uh, across these, well, across these 149 countries cost about $58 trillion. US is about six, China's about uh, 15, and Europe's about five uh, trillion dollars. But what's more important is what's the annual cost of energy versus a business as usual case. So in business as usual today, the world spends about $11 trillion per year on energy. That's across all energy sectors. That's expected to go up to about 16 and a half trillion per year by 2050. Uh, health costs, um, this is accounting for efficiencies in, in combustion techno uh, control technologies. Even with that, uh, $34 trillion per year in health costs uh, due to air pollution from energy, uh, $34 trillion by 2050, $31 trillion for climate costs by 2050. So total social costs about $81 trillion per year. But we eliminate health and climate costs entirely from energy with wind, water, solar. Our energy requirements go down 54%, as I mentioned, another 15% cost per unit energy reduction, and we're down to an energy and social cost in wind, water, solar in 2050 of $6.7 trillion per year. So just on the energy cost savings alone, that's $10 trillion per year. So if we divide 58 trillion upfront cost by $10 trillion per year savings, that's a payback time of almost six years. And the social cost payback time is even lower. It's 81 trillion minus 6.7 trillion. So $75 trillion per year social cost savings. So that's less than one year payback time in terms of the social cost of a transition. If that doesn't incite you to want to transition to clean renewable energy right away. I don't know what will. It's about as big of a savings as you can possibly hope for uh, for anything. And just to give you an idea that, I mean, that's assuming only a 15% cost per unit energy reduction with wind, water, solar, because we're reducing energy requirements so much. But Irina just came out with these numbers, a weighted average worldwide cost of utility PV, onshore wind, offshore wind, geothermal, and hydro are all less than fossil fuels in the worldwide average. And this should really help to explain why this transition is possible because the costs are so low right now and the efficiencies are so high, uh, this should motivate a transition. Um, one technology I mentioned, fire bricks, these are basically kiln bricks. They've been around in different forms for thousands of years since the Bronze Age. Uh, they are now, if you take the composition of clay, uh, the different components, silica, magnesia, alumina, and chromia, in different compositions, you can make some bricks that can store heat for very high temperatures, up to 2,000 degrees uh, Celsius. And you can have other bricks that are insulating bricks that surround the heat bricks. And these can be used. Well, you can imagine if we electrify all energy and then use arc furnaces, induction furnaces, etc. Well, if industry wants to run 24-7 and you know, wind doesn't always blow, sun doesn't always shine, we're going to need a lot of battery storage. Now, an alternative system is where we use these fire bricks to, to convert the electricity from wind and solar to high temperature heat that is stored in the fire bricks. And then you blow air through channels in the bricks. That air gets heated to very high temperature and then provides heat for industry. And then you can do that 24-7. The difference is 
that fire brick storage is about one tenth the cost uh, per kilowatt hour of heat storage than batteries are per kilowatt hour of electricity storage. So it costs less, but also you eliminate the need for arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces also, because there's resistance heating elements attached to the bricks and that's what heats the bricks. And so you have that heat right there. This can save a huge amount of money. Um, but just to summarize the benefits of bricks, they store low to high temperature heat for 90% of industrial processes. They are heat by resistance heating and you can get the heat from 100% renewables and it's about a 98% round trip efficiency of the heat. And the storage, the heat can be stored at a loss of only 1% per day. So they, and there are multiple companies actually building these bricks for industry right now as we speak. So this is a commercialized technology, but it is pretty new. Um, and the cost, as I said, one tenth the cost per unit energy. We did tests across 149 countries with fire bricks replacing uh, the other types of industrial heating. And we found it would reduce the capital cost from that 58.2 trillion that I mentioned before by about 1.3 trillion uh, down to 56.97 trillion dollars and levelized cost of energy by about 1.8%. So that's a good technology moving forward. Well, what's not good? Um, let's start with carbon capture. So we did studies across the 149 countries. Of, we compared the business as usual case, which I already talked about, and the wind, water, solar case, which I talked about, with two additional cases where, and we did that, this is extreme, of course, but we have to look at the extremes to see really whether a technology is useful or not in any sense, uh, where we attach carbon capture to every stationary source and use direct air capture to offset every mobile source of emissions or station or area source of emissions. So basically this is instead of going wind water solar, let's just say we do carbon capture for everything or direct air capture. And we did two carbon capture cases. One is where we power the carbon capture with business as usual fuels and the other where we power the carbon capture with wind water solar electricity. And so those are the BAUCC-BAU case and BAUCC-WWS case. So just to hear are the assumptions in the in all these carbon capture cases, we, the 2050 energy demand goes down first by about 6.7% because that's what we assumed in the uh, wind, water, solar case due to energy efficiency improvements beyond business as usual. But 9.8% of the remaining business usual demand comes from wind, water, and solar and 2.3% comes from existing nuclear, which is about the current ratio. So you know about 11 or 12% of the energy don't have any emissions associated with that, although there is some emissions associated with nuclear in reality. 85% of the remaining business as usual carbon dioxide equivalent emissions are carbon dioxide itself. So that could be captured with the equipment and the rest isn't captured. And then the carbon capture equipment and direct air capture equipment are 80% efficient, which is actually uh, really optimistic because I'll show you the data. There, the real capture rates in projects worldwide are 10 to 80% with a mean of about 50%. So 80% is very optimistic. And then it takes about 25% more energy to run this carbon capture and direct air capture equipment. Uh, that, and the IPCC estimates give a range of 13 to 44%. So, and then finally, it assumes all CO2 is stored, although worldwide 82% of all CO2 captured today is used for enhanced oil recovery which immediately releases 40% of the CO2 right back to the air. And then because you get about two tons of, two barrels of oil for every ton of carbon dioxide and you, that gets burned, uh, there's anywhere from 20% of that, 20% uh, of the carbon you're stored to 85% is also emitted just due to the burning of the extra oil. So that's, but now we're assuming everything is stored just for simplicity, just so now let's, well, before I show you the result on that, here are the data showing the actual capture rates from all sorts of carbon capture projects around the world, and they range from 10 to 80% in reality. So we're assuming 80% trying to give them benefit of the doubt. Okay, so here are the results when we look at the energy requirements. So, so in the top left is the energy requirements with carbon capture. You can see carbon capture increases energy requirements compared with business as usual. Whether we power it with wind, water, solar, or business as usual, you need more energy when we use wind, water, solar, we go down 54% compared to business as usual. In terms of air pollution, because you have more, you require more energy, and it's mostly business as usual energy. You have in the when in business as usual energy is powering carbon capture, you actually increase air pollution deaths compared with business as usual. When you're using wind, water, solar to power the carbon capture, you have a slight decrease, about six percent, six to seven percent, but still huge. In wind, water, solar, you go to zero deaths. In carbon emissions that goes down somewhat, it doesn't go down to zero, 
uh, but it goes down. That's the only thing that goes down. But then you look at the social costs of all these. Social costs is energy costs plus health costs plus climate costs. What we see is both carbon capture cases are between 10 and 11 times the social cost as wind, water, solar. So in other words, if you look at it, every dollar you spent on carbon capture, you're increasing air pollution, energy requirements, carbon dioxide emissions, social costs, and energy costs relative to wind, water, solar. So it's always a loser. There's no benefit whatsoever. It only increases carbon dioxide no matter what you do at any scale. And this shows the extreme case. So the conclusion with regard to that is climate policies that propose and use carbon capture and or synthetic direct air carbon capture. So that means not trees. Trees are okay. These are just synthetic. To reduce energy related to CO2 will instead increase air pollution, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, energy needs, and private energy costs substantially relative to policies requiring 100% wind, water, solar. Social costs will be 9.3 to 10.7 times those with 100% wind, water, solar. The conclusions apply to any level of carbon removal above zero. Carbon capture and synthetic direct air carbon capture may on the limit cause millions of unnecessary air pollution deaths each year and substantial climate damage in the short and long term. As such, policies promoting them should be abandoned. Now, let me just talk about one more thing that'll stop. Um, nuclear, you know, there's a lot of push for nuclear. Okay, so here are the actual construction and planning to operation times for most nuclear reactors built to today. In Finland, 23 years from planning to operation. One, uh, Hinkley is expected to be 21 to 23 years. Vogel three and four, the only reactors built in the US in the last 30 years is 17 to 18 years. Flamanville, France, 20 years. Haiyang, one and two in China, 13 to 14 years. Taishan, one and two in China, 12 to 13 years. Shido Bay in China, 17 years. Baraka, one to four in UAE, 12 to 15 years. These are planning to operation types. So in North America and Europe, there's 17 to 23 years planned to operation times of nuclear. Uh, rest of the world or the whole world, nothing less than 12 years and up to 23 years. And if we look on the right, the costs are eight, 19, 16, 16 dollars in a watt compared with new sol utility solars is 0.8 dollars a watt. So we're talking 10 to 20 times the capital cost and three to eight times the energy cost as new wind or solar for new nuclear. It takes 10, 12 to 23 years between planning and operation versus 0 0.5 to five years for new wind or solar. So you just on its own, we cannot invest in technologies that just take too long because we have five to six years to solve 80% of the problem and maybe 10 years to solve 100%. And if you have technologies that are taking 12, 17, 20 years, that's just useless. In addition, there's nine to 37 times the carbon dioxide equivalent emissions from nuclear versus wind. Uh, and as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says, there's robust evidence, high agreement that increased use of nuclear leads to more weapons proliferation risk, meltdown risk, waste risk for up to 200,000 plus years, underground mining, lung cancer risk, uranium mining, lung cancer risk as well. So just, okay, so summarize, re clean renewable energy is the way to go just based on the science uh, and in terms of economics, in terms of, I didn't talk about land, but it's also in terms of land use. Uh, job creation and the things that don't work, carbon capture, direct air capture, small, large nuclear reactors, bioenergy, these are not going to be helpful going forward. Uh, we need to focus on solutions that do work rapidly at low cost, can be implemented quickly and efficiently. And so clean renewable energy is the way to go and efficiency, electrification. Uh, here's just more information, resources if you're interested and thank you very much. Mark, thank you.